the state of slavery is of such a nature that it is incapable of being introduced on any reasons, moral or political, but only by positive law. It is so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law. Whatever inconveniences, therefore, may follow from the decision, I cannot say this case is allowed or approved by the law of England, and therefore the black must be discharged. On June 22, 1772, William Murray, the first Earl of Mansfield, Lord Mansfield at the Court of King's Bench in London, handed down a unanimous decision in favor of James Somerset, a slave brought to England from the American British colonies. Many in England and in British colonial America believed, though falsely, that this decision prohibited slavery in England. Many in the colonies believed that as a result of this decision, Parliament could and would meddle with and destroy their livelihoods and society. As a result, the quarrels and disturbances that had begun to fracture colonial British relations after the Treaty of Paris in 1763 escalated. Within three years, the two sides would be at war, and within four, the Second Continental Congress would vote to sever connections with the British Crown and declare independence. Born in Africa, James Somerset came to Norfolk, Virginia in 1749. There, on August 1st of that year, he was purchased by Charles Stewart, a 24-year-old Scott merchant. Stewart trained Somerset as his personal servant. In 1762, Stewart joined the Customs Service and rose to the rank of Paymaster General of the American Board of Customs. In 1769, following the death of his sister Cecilia's husband, Stuart took Somerset with him to England. They settled in London, and Somerset, who now had new household duties, quickly learned how to navigate the city and found friends among the thousands of former slaves and free blacks living there. In August 1771, Somerset was baptized and took for his first name James. His godparents were Thomas Waltkin, Elizabeth Cade, and John Morrow. Somerset insulted Stuart when he ran away on October 1, 1771. Somerset was caught and, according to his godparents, who provided affidavits to the Court of King's Bench for a writ of habeas corpus, was confined in irons on board a ship called the Anne and Mary. John Knowles' commander, lying in the Thames and bound for Jamaica. The King's Bench was the oldest and highest common law court in England. At the time of these proceedings, it consisted of a chief justice and four associate justices, including William Blackstone, the father of modern common law and the author of Commentaries on the Laws of England. In 1765, he had written regarding slavery in England. And the spirit of liberty is so deeply implanted in our Constitution and rooted 
even in our very soil, that a slave or negro, the moment he lands in England, falls under the protection of the laws, and so far becomes a freeman. A writ of habeas corpus is a legal action that provides a way for someone to seek relief from unlawful detention. According to Blackstone, the first recorded usage of habeas corpus in English common law was in 1305. The Habeas Corpus Act, 1679, codified the action. Lord Mansfield was the Chief Justice. While his sympathies lay with the abolitionists, his love was for the law. Knowles appeared before the court. He explained that his charge was simple, that Somerset was the negro slave of Charles Stuart, Esquire, who had delivered Somerset into Mr. Knowles' custody in order to carry him to Jamaica and there sell him as a slave. William Davy, Somerset's lawyer, requested additional time to prepare his case. Mansfield released Somerset, who promised to appear at the final hearing in his case on June 22, 1772. Upon his release, Somerset met with Granville Sharp, one of England's leading abolitionists. Sharp had helped other slaves win their freedom. His first case had involved Jonathan Strong, who had come from Barbados with his master, David Lyle. Lyle beat Strong close to death and ordered him out of his house onto the mean streets of 18th century London. Sharp came across Strong and took him to St. Bartholomew's Hospital, where he spent four months recovering from his injuries. When he was well, Sharp helped Strong find employment with a Mr. Brown, an apothecary. Strong lived freely for two years until, by chance, Lyle spied him. Lyle had him arrested. Strong sent for Sharp, who challenged the legality of Strong's imprisonment. On the 18th of September, 1767, the Lord Mayor, Sir Robert Kite, discharged Strong because the lad had not stolen anything and was not guilty of any offense and was therefore at liberty to go away. Meanwhile, James Kerr, a Jamaican planter who had bought Strong from Lyle, sued the Sharps for trespass for depriving him of his property. The Sharp brothers engaged lawyers to defend them, who, to their dismay, quoted the York Talbot ruling of 1729. The ruling said that a slave did not become free on coming to England. He did not become free by baptism, and that any master might compel his slave to return to the West Indies. App appalled, Sharp devoted himself to overturning York Talbot. His victory came on June 22, 1772. Mansfield's ruling in the Somerset case set the precedent that made slavery unlawful in England. It did not end the slave trade or slavery elsewhere within the empire. The slave trade would remain lawful until 1807 and slavery until 1832 in the rest of the empire. However, in England's North American colonies, the various colonial leaders worried that Parliament would apply the ruling against them. Many historians, including Alfred and Ruth Bloom Rosen have begun to theorize that slavery and the colonists' fears regarding Mansfield's decision played a larger role in the movement for independence. The first Africans to come to Jamestown, Britain's first successful North American colony, arrived in August of 1619 on a Dutch man-of-war. Kidnapped from their homes in Africa by Spanish slavers, 
who were then robbed by the Dutch captain and crew, the twenty and odd blacks were sold or traded into servitude for supplies. Evidence exists that these first African servants were treated as indentured servants. In the early years of the colony, many Africans and poor whites, most of the first laborers came from the English working class, stood on the same ground. Black and white worked side by side in the fields. All were indentured servants. During their time as servants, they were fed and housed. Afterwards, they would be given what was known as freedom dues, which usually included a piece of land and supplies, including a gun. Black-skinned or white-skinned, they became free. One of the few recorded histories of an African in America that we can glean from early court records is that of Antonio the Negro, as he was named in the 1625 Virginia census. He was brought to the colony in 1621. At this time, English and colonial law did not define racial slavery. The census calls him not a slave, but a servant. Later, Antonio changed his name to Anthony Johnson, married an African-American servant named Mary, and they had four children. Mary and Anthony also became free, and he soon owned land and cattle and even indentured servants of his own. In 1650, Anthony was still one of only 400 Africans in the colony among nearly 19,000 settlers. In Johnson's own county, at least 20 African American men and women were free. 13 owned their own homes. In 1640, John Punch, a black indentured servant who had fled from his plantation was sentenced to serve his said master or his assigns for the time of his natural life. He was made a slave. This is the re first recorded incidence of permanent slavery in the colonies. In 1661, the Virginia House of Burgesses officially recognized slavery by statute. The following year, the Colonial Assembly went one step further by stating that children born would be bonded or free according to the status of the mother. The status of blacks in Virginia slowly changed over the last half of the 17th century. In 1705, the Virginia General Assembly sealed the fate of all black servants when it declared, all servants imported and brought into the country who were not Christians in their native country, shall be accounted and be slaves. All Negro, Mulatto, and Indian slaves within this dominion shall be held to be real estate. If any slave resists his master, correcting such slave, and shall happen to be killed in such correction, the master shall be free of all punishment, as if such accident never happened. Indentured servants and slaves provided the colonies, especially the southern colonies, which were always short of labor with necessary workers. Because of their, cli because of their climate and England's market needs as expressed in the Navigation Acts, the southern colonies based their economies on the production of cash crops, tobacco, in Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina, and rice and indigo in South Carolina and Georgia, which had been established in 1733 by the humanitarian James Oglethorpe as a non-slave colony. Bacon's Rebellion in 1675-1676 sped the transition between indentured servitude and slavery. In 1676, Nathaniel Bacon, a young, wealthy Englishman who had recently settled in the back country of Virginia, 
led an army of 500 men from the ranks of backcountry planters, farmers, formerly indentured servants, and even freed blacks to attack Indians who had raided their plantations and farms. The government at Jamestown considered the army a rabble mob and declared Bacon a traitor. Bacon then marched on the colonial seat of government in Jamestown, burning it to the ground and forcing the governor to flee across the Chesapeake Bay to the eastern shore. Before a British naval squadron arrived, Bacon came down with a serious attack of dysentery and died. Bacon's appeal to enslaved blacks to join his cause struck fear into the hearts of Tidewater planters. His actions looked to them as a biracial alliance of the lower classes against the property elite. To continue to use white indentured servants who could obtain guns as freemen and women appeared to threaten a social order that privileged the upper class elite. By 1700, planters had switched almost completely to enslaved Africans in hopes of uniting all whites into a race-based alliance between the wealthy planters and poor whites. Historians view Bacon's rebellion as a major turning point in the history of slavery in that white southerners thereafter defined freedom and equality in terms of race rather than class. To be free and white was the promise of American equality, and all whites thereafter shared a common bond in their whiteness that superseded any class differences. Slavery rapidly became an institutional force in colonial America, especially in the southern colonies. By 1755, Maryland had 46,225 slaves, Virginia 116,000 slaves, North Carolina 20,000 slaves, South Carolina 45,000 slaves, and Georgia 2,000, totaling 229,225 slaves. Twenty years later, in 1775, Maryland had 70,000 slaves, Virginia 200,000, North Carolina 45,000, South Carolina 110,000, and Georgia 15,000, nearly doubling the total in 1755. Slavery, however, was not solely confined to the middle colonies and their plantations. About 29,000 slaves lived in the middle colonies and 16,000 in New England in 1775.